Matthew chapter 6, and uh, it is a joy to have my family here. Joe will be leaving tomorrow, heading back to Florida, and then he'll head back to England uh, on Saturday, Friday or Saturday, so really good to have them here for these couple, couple days, and wonderful little surprise. Matthew chapter 6, please, and we're going to read verses 24 through 34. We'll read it just a moment, but let me just make sure we're all back into our our Bible study mode. We've been dealing with the subject of eternity. And we're looking at what Jesus said about eternity. Several weeks ago when I began this, I illustrated for you how very difficult it is for us to understand eternity. All we know is what we experience. All we know is what we feel, sense, uh, encounter in our human perspective. And I gave that illustration, if you remember, about that little boy that had cataract surgery, never seen before in his life. They did the surgery, 1908 or 10. They took the bandages off. The boy had never seen. When they took the bandages off, they held a hand in front of him. They said, what do you see? And you remember what he said? I don't know. He was looking at a hand. You know what that is, but he'd never seen one. That's very relative to our understanding of eternity. So Jesus takes this sixth chapter of Matthew and deals with this subject in such a way, such a practical way, that it is incumbent upon us to study that, and that's what we've been doing in these studies. Let's read the text. I'll give you a brief review of what we've covered and then get into a third or fourth thought tonight. Verse number 24, Matthew 6 Looking together, the key verse in the chapter is verse 24. No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life. What shall ye eat, or what shall ye drink? Nor yet for your body, what shall ye put on, or what ye shall put on? Is, it, uh, is not the life more than meat? and the body than raiment. Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns. Yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are ye not much better than they? Which of you by taking thought can add one cubit unto his stature? And why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field. Let me stop there. Have you noticed how many times the word thought is in the text? We'll come back to that. You might want to mark those times. He says, verse, verse 28, Why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow, they toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothe the grass of the field which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? I love that verse. Reminds me I need to have big faith. He says next, therefore take no thought, saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink, wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knoweth that ye need, have need of all these things. Let's read 33 out loud together. Ready to begin. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Now here it is again. Therefore take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought For the things of itself, sufficient unto the day, is the evil thereof. Let's pray together. Now, Father, help me get into the lesson, to be thorough, to be spirit sensitive. And Lord, having done all that, I'm praying that those in the pew tonight, those listening tonight, those being attentive tonight, will be obedient to what the Spirit of God says. So change us, make us what you want us to be through the power of your word. And most of all, if there's one listening, even now, that has never been saved, truly born again. We pray that, God, you'll squeeze their heart with conviction that they might be saved even tonight. We ask it in the name of Jesus. Amen. Last time we were looking at Jesus' teaching on how to move past the earthy to the eternal or beyond the accumulation of things and wealth unto the approval of God because that's what we want. It isn't about accumulation here. Because uh, Jesus told us what happens with our food, our clothes, and our shelter, these things that we think we have to have, they end up with moths and rust and thieves. Remember that? So we focus, we we want to learn to focus rather on the approval 
of God. And Jesus is presenting for us what I call uh, concepts of eternal significance. These are concepts. Now, I thought about that word, and I'm being sensitive to the crowd here because we have youngsters in here as well. And I want to make sure you kids never think that that's a big word. I don't need to know what it means. You're going to learn in life. Life is all about words. So I looked up the word concept, and I wanted to get a definition on it because that's primarily what we're dealing with, concepts of having a life that's geared toward the eternal. So having an eternal concept in our lives. Here's the definition. A concept is a general notion, a plan or intention. Here's, here's a more uh, defined definition of that. A concept is a conceived thought. It's a conceived thought. So this is a real challenge for us, isn't it? To actually conceive a thought that's eternal. Because we're so temporal. All we know is what we feel and see and touch. And somehow Jesus wants us to live beyond this temporal with the eternal in view. How do you get that concept? Have you ever thought about what it must have been like for the person in, give me a state. Kids, name a state besides South Carolina. Raise your hand if you have a state. Yes, Sarah. Texas. Can you imagine being in Texas? All right, give me a city in Texas now. Somebody else. Raymond. All right, Houston, Texas. Can you imagine Brother Caleb being in Houston, Texas, walking along your, your, your farm row, you just plowed a field, and you look up, and there's a biplane flying. You've never seen one before. Now, you're right now saying, so? Realize this, in the history of the world, nothing had ever flown before besides birds. And all of a sudden, you look up, and you hear the sound of an engine, and you see a, 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 an amazing acrobatic man with these big goggles and, and this helmet, just a, a leather head, head cover, and he's flying, and you're like, what is that? Can you imagine the first time somebody in, give me another state on this side, somebody over here, give me a state, quick, 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 uh, Doc in the back. Why did you have to choose that state? Because here's my problem with Alaska. You look up and you see a blimp. I don't know if Alaska can even, it's too cold up there, I think. But you look up and you see a blimp. I mean, right now, if you saw a blimp today, you'd be like, whoa, because we're so unfamiliar with them. The other day I was in Michigan fishing with my brothers. Boy, was that an experience. And uh, talk about a ship of fools. Uh, but uh, we're fishing together and flying literally no more than 200 feet above the lake was a triplane, a triplane with three wings. It was so cool. But can you imagine what it was like? You'd never experienced it before. You never saw a plane. That kind of gives us an idea of what maybe Jesus is trying to introduce us to. I saw this video, man, this is hilarious. I want you to look at the screens. This video of a little baby that had never tasted Coca-Cola. Look at this response. It's to be pure joy. I don't know, I think the bubbles are gonna hurt. They're gonna hurt! <laughs> <laughs> Look at her face. Isn't that hilarious? She never had it before. I got, you know, there's, there's YouTubes on this. You can, you can look at these. One more. We're going to show one more right after that. Uh, the, the, the YouTubes about uh, people that, that never had an In-N-Out burger. Or people that had in and out to West Coast Burger. Or people who never had, well, watch this one. This is about real Sicilian Italians that tasted Domino's, Little Caesars. Look at this response. In this video, I want to show you what happens if you serve this type of fake Italian food to an Italian.
Me lo posso mangiare. Mai mangiate in vita mia. Io con mia moglie ho, ho, ho mangiato sempre siciliano, sempre la roba, la nostra roba italiana, bella. Intanto questa qua... Uh, no, 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 io questi qua non li mangio. È lo schifo, non si può mangiare. Guarda, se un cane mio, pure un cane mio, ma ti la faccio. Eh, no, no, schifo totale. Can you imagine? This, this concept about heaven is so hard to get into our heads. So I've been trying to use the concepts of Jesus' teaching in Matthew 6 to help just open up your eyes a little bit on this thing. You know, being a young person, it's hard to live past school starts. That's the next thing on your mind, school starting. And then, uh, uh, you know, um, Thanksgiving. I know it's hard to live past that. Or, or uh, we were praying up here a few minutes ago and Noah was already praying about help us be safe when we go back because they're going to be here through next week. And I'm, I'm thinking this is the way kids live. They, they basically live in these short increments of time. But even you young people, God wants you to develop a pattern in your life that you're living beyond this life. You're thinking about eternity. Now, I know I said that just now, and inside my mind I'm saying, do you hear what you're trying to do? You're trying to get young people to think that way? But how many of you kids have already memorized Matthew 6.33? Just a couple of you. And it's a great verse to memorize. I'm not asking that to shame anybody. But we must learn to live with, but seek ye first the kingdom of God. How do you seek the kingdom of God first, Josh, if you don't realize that there's something eternal awaiting us? So this is what we're dealing with, and I've got just a little bit of time, so I want to give you a, a review of the two concepts we've already covered. The first one was this, the develop, uh, having an eternal mindset helps us develop our perspective. So we have to have a perspective on eternal things to help us live with an eternal viewpoint in life. Uh, and we summarize it this way, what you treasure is determined by your perspective of what you value. What you treasure is determined by your perspective, your perspective of what you value, of what you're looking at. So we made the statement, your treasure is what you treasure. That's a noun and a verb. And so we need to learn to treasure those things that are beyond what we hold in our hands. Now let's just be real honest now. Be real honest here. How many here like money? Be honest. You better believe you do. You find $20, you're like... Everything's going my way. I'll never forget, I was running years ago in Manteca, and uh, I was running, got done with my run, and I looked down and I saw a $50 bill laying right on the sidewalk. And instantly, I did this. Because I'm wondering, is anybody coming for this thing? And I'm looking, and, and, uh, and I looked way down the path, and I saw a woman, so I just thought, well... If I walk past it thinking it's hers, chances are it's not hers. She's going to take it. So bless the Lord, I'm going to take it. So I picked it up. And I just kept walking. And, uh, and I walked right by her. And I'm thinking, as I'm walking up to her, I'm starting to sweat. Because I'm thinking, sure enough, she's going to say, Sir, did you see any money? And if she would, I want to hear, you know. But I walked by her. She didn't say a word. And as soon as I got 10 feet from her, I went back to running. I got out of there as quick as I could. And then, Pastor Brenberg, I did what all men always must do when you find money. Never tell your wife. <laughs> and I didn't tell her. What your, tre your, your treasure is what you treasure. We carried that a couple weeks ago. Number two, here was the second thought, and I'm going to deal just a little bit more of this tonight. What you treasure determines your priorities. Priorities. We talk about the perspective, that seeing what you're looking at, And then we talked about priorities. That's what you're seeking. So we go from seeing to seeking. Priorities do several things with us. I gave you these last time. One, they help us set up, uh, pardon me, priorities help us stay after what is most important. Priorities do that. They help us live after what is most important. Not everything is equal in importance. If you don't understand that, you're going to wear yourself out. You'll be unaffected. You have to find out what are your top number one 
Number two, number three, priorities. So priorities help us stay after what is most important. And what is most important in the life of the child of God? His approval. What did I just say? His approval. Folks, if we don't get that down, we're going to find ourselves living for all kinds of stuff. So his approval is our number one priority. Then number two, priorities help us give attention to the best, uh, give attention to our best resources. In other words, you only have so much health, so much energy, so much money. You have so much, only so much mind capacity. And if you're constantly expending your best resources, you will not live to your best priorities. You can't, you cannot, here's the phrase Jesus used, you cannot cast your pearls before the swine. You have to be careful who you give your emotions to. You have to be careful who you give your energy to. You need to find out who in your life is an energy sucker. You get around them, they draw you out. You're empty every time you get around them. Here's my advice, stay away from them. Run from them. If there are people that every time you get with them, you find yourself fatigued, depressed, and worn out, maybe you ought to draw a circle around yourself and say, I'm going to protect me. You have to protect your resources, and I could say so much more about that because I've been in the ministry a long time, and that's certainly a vital part of uh, being a people person. Number three, I'm talking about your, your treasure determines our priorities. We said last time that priorities, uh, priorities uh, uh, help us give proper attention to what we must learn to say no to. You have to say no to some things. Do you hate it? I know you hate it. As a pastor, I don't think I've said no to 10 people in my entire ministry. That's the honest truth. I've just not said no to people. There's a way to say no without saying no. Is everybody still listening? You ought to learn what I'm telling you right now. If you want to be a leader, you have to learn these things. You don't say no to Most men can't take a no. Brother, you want to do this? No. It hurts them. They get offended, get cracked like eggshells. But, but and by the way, I'm not playing you folks. I'm just telling you, you have to learn to set things in your life uh, around priority. But sometimes you got to say no. You just got to put your feet down and not budge and say no. Uh, by the way, you have to say no to sin. People come along, try to pull you into something, push you into something. Just learn to say N-O, no. Uh, eternity will clarify where you will not go what you will not do, and what you will not give up. Did you all catch what I just said? I said that last time, and i got to keep moving here. It will help clarify those things. Now just imagine Jesus is teaching his disciples to perceive and prioritize eternity, and they just couldn't get it. Over in Luke chapter 8, Jesus was talking about the seed and the sower. I'm going to remember that parable. The man would sow the seed upon the, the, the four different types of soil. And you remember that one where, where it says that he, 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 he put the seed in his disciples to perceive and prattle by the, by the cares and the riches and the pleasures of this life. Choked by the stuff of this life. Let's just put it right back into this context. He said this, he said, the seed of the word of God is only effective based on how the soil accepts the seed. And if your life is too choked with stuff, you'll not be able to take the precious seed of the word of God. You gotta download things, get stuff out. Look at your time that you're wasting. Look at your life. Look at the energy that you're expending on, on everybody's business. We got on that last time about everybody's, everybody's stuff is out there today. Everybody knows what everybody's doing. I'll never forget, I walked into a large church, and, and uh, uh, Macy's here, so I, I always like to illustrate my kids are here, but not too much. But uh, uh, I'll never forget, I walked in, and a fellow walked up to me and said, Oh, Dr. Tharp, he said, I love your granddaughter, Macy. I went like, I'll get ready to deck the guy in the mouth. I'm like, how do you know my granddaughter, Macy? He said, oh, I watch her online. He said, her, her mother's Facebook of Macy. And he went on. He started telling me all this stuff about Macy. I didn't even know because he was into her Facebook. I'm not preaching the least about her Facebook, but maybe you ought to listen to your dad once in a while. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> just too much people's business. Amen. I got to move along. This is going over like a lead balloon. Amen. I remember I did a funeral for a fellow in California, and uh, he was a biker. I did funerals all the time for folks I didn't even know, and I didn't know this man at all. 
So my job was to do the, uh, the funeral at the funeral home, and then they were going to have a graveside later down near Oceanside, California. And uh, so I did the funeral, and, and I was talking to, the, to his buddies that were there. I don't think maybe one or two family members. His whole life became the motorcycle group that he was part of, like a, like a club, you know. And, uh, and I was talking to those guys. I said, well, is he going to be buried here uh, in this cemetery? He said, they said, oh, no, we're burying him down in Oceanside. I said, really? I said, uh, why down there? They said, well, we got a big, big hole dug, and we're going to put his ashes in the hole, but we're going to put his motorcycle there with him because we want to bury him with his motorcycle. And they literally drove that motorcycle into that hole and buried him with his motorcycle. How many think that motorcycle, that's about 10 years ago, how many think it's in pretty bad shape now? It's all rotting. It's rusting. You see, he lived for that. That's what they thought his life was all about. That's a really sad life to live. It's a sad life to live. He's, he's just thinking in terms of, of a birth and a death. And a motorcycle isn't going to help him now. It doesn't even have relevance to him. As a matter of fact, one day when they dig that spot, they're going to think, who, what nutcase buried a motorcycle here? A perfectly good motorcycle. Living for, the, flat, living for the, the temporal. People listen to me. Young and old listen to me. Be careful to not lose your spiritual vision of eternity. Seeing past this life. You've got to look down the road. You're going to be somewhere forever. I'll never forget one day my, my dad was suffering with a, a disease. He was paralyzed. He couldn't move and we had to take care of him, had to shave him, had to wash his face, comb his hair, everything. Got up in the morning after an ho- awful night trying to sleep. He couldn't sleep. Got up in the morning. I washed his face. I shaved him. And uh, Dad was paralyzed, couldn't use his hands. And, uh, and I'll never forget, I walked over to him and, and I put his glasses on him because every morning I'd set his Bible up. He had a little, little thing like Doc built me, a little stand for the Bible. It was over his hips and we put his Bible there and we'd turn the pages for him. And I put his glasses on him and I walked into the kitchen to get a cup of coffee. And I remember he, he started yelling, Eric, Eric, Eric. And I came in and said, what is the matter, Dad? He said, I can't see, I can't see. Uh, my, my eyes, I can't see. And I, I pulled his glasses off and I cleaned them. I put them back on. And he said again, son, there's something wrong. I, I can't see. I, my, my eyes are too blurry. I can't see. And I, I, I'm thinking, what is going on with my dad? He's, he, he, he's falling apart. He's paralyzed. Now he's going blind, I thought. And then it hit me. My glasses look very similar to his. <laughs> and I went over and got his glasses and I just sheepishly said, well, try this, Dad. And I put him on his eyes, and, and he went, you're trying to kill me. <laughs> oh, I said, I'm so sorry. But this is exactly an illustration of what's happening every morning when you get up and you put on the glasses of just this life. Does anybody get what I'm talking about? Jesus said, don't look through life through the lenses of the temporal. Do you know where you're living right now? Somebody else is going to live there. It's amazing. I built a house literally from scratch. Ground was trees when I cleared it. I built the house with my own hands. You know, tonight somebody else lives in that house. (laughs) It's amazing. And you'll one day be forgotten. Two generations out, you'll be no more on this earth. Somebody walk by your grave and say, that must have been somebody's dad, somebody's brother. (laughs) I'm not trying to depress you, but that's the facts. And Jesus said, get your eyes on the eternal. So we're talking about having a uh, perspective and a perception, priorities about eternal. I'll never forget in California, uh, we lived in Santa Clara and uh, just thinking about these illustrations. I don't always do personal illustrations, but uh, remember I, we, we lived not too far from a Safeway, a grocery store there. And uh, I would go there constantly, you know, it was on my way to the church and, and uh, I... Uh, happened to see in our neighborhood a, a lady from China, an older Chinese lady. I can remember, I can see her in my mind's eye right now, as she walked every day with a cane. It was a red and white cane, and on the tip was black, and, and she, was, she would walk every day, and she would find her way over all the cracks and all the bumps, all the little jigs and jags and curbs. You know, when you cross into a, a, a street or a, a pathway for cars, there's always that bump. Uh, those little bumps, that's for de- blind people. And she'd feel those bumps and she'd cross the street. 
and, uh, and, and her, her whole perception was that cane. If she didn't have that cane leading the way, you understand, she was facing potential disaster all the time, but for the cane. Hoping that people would give her a wide berth as her walking was this way. And Christian, this is what eternity helps us do as we think. I'm trying to help the kids with these illustrations. Everybody, are you patient with me, church? This is pretty basic. But kids, this is what Jesus is saying. Don't, don't live for money. Don't live for temporary things. Don't live for your clothes. You can't really see what heaven's like nobody here has. You don't know what eternity's like, but I want you to learn to quit looking at everything down here. He wants you to kind of be like a blind lady just fumbling your way through because you've got a different vision. See, she sees stuff you don't see. Blind people, don't think blind people can't see. They see way better. Deaf people have a better perception but because the senses. And, and Jesus is trying to lift, lift our perception and lift our priorities. Second Corinthians, or First Corinthians chapter 2, verses 14 through 16. Let's go over there, please, if we, if we could. And I'm doing just fine on time. Second Corinthians chapter 2, I want you to see a couple verses here. The great Apostle Paul gives us tremendous verses, good verses to memorize, and you, you know this verse, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, and I think I said second, I didn't mean to. First, 1 Corinthians 2, look at verse number 14. Scripture says, But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. Now let me stop there. I'm not adding to the Scripture. I'm not taking from the Scripture. I am using synonyms. Synonyms clarify. So we could use the word perceive here. Receive, perceive, understand. The natural man comprehends, understands, gets it, not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are what? Foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. So this verse tells us we have a natural discerning and a spiritual discerning. Who has the spiritual discerning? Only they that are saved. If you're saved, God has given you a spiritual discernment, verse 15. But he that is spiritual judgeth all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. For who hath known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. So that's a great verse. It's telling us this. You can know what God wants you to know. You can have a spiritual mind. And so this is a great inspiration to us tonight. So the natural man sees and seeks what? Foolish things. That's really what the verses are telling us. The natural man, that's the unsaved man, seeks foolish things. But isn't it ironic? The, fool, the unsaved man calls us foolish. What makes the difference? It's where you're looking. It's where you're looking. If you've never seen someone running for health, and you see a man running, you think, that guy's a nutcase. What's he running for? What did he do wrong? But he's running for health. He, he sees it differently. His run is for health. His run is for energy. His run is for self-energizing. Uh, uh, but somebody that doesn't understand that looks and thinks they're foolish. Same thing with a weight trainer. Why, well, you look at a guy pushing weights. That guy's crazy. I don't want to do that. That's too much work. But wait a minute. He's doing it for something you don't understand. And Christian, listen to me. Living with eternity in view, the world will never understand that. But we do because we have the mind of Christ. Amen? I... Uh, Let's make some personal application here. Uh, you might be wondering, why do we make such a big deal about marriage? I mean, if, if somebody loves somebody, why can't they just marry? Listen to me. We don't make a big deal about it. God does. And to this world, they may think, well, that's foolish. That a man, listen, if a man loves a man, he ought to be able to marry that man. What does God say about it? It doesn't matter what I think about it. Who asked you anyways? It's what does the Bible say? Oh, what's the big deal, preacher? A girl, she doesn't need to keep herself pure for marriage. She can do what she wants. She'll find a man, they'll have a happy marriage, and maybe they will. But God makes a big deal about virginity, that a young person ought to stay pure until marriage. You say, well, I don't see it that way. Who cares how you see it? In the end, it doesn't matter what I think. What matters is what God thinks. Amen? Come on, help me, church. Uh, uh, priorities. Listen, just do what you want. Do what makes you feel good. I mean, after all, isn't life all about being happy? Well, let me give you a word 
that tells you what that kind of thinking is. It's called hedonism. Hedonism is what we don't want to have in this church. That is living for pleasure. After all, it's all about me being happy. I'm on this earth to be happy. Really? What does God say? God says this, you're only happy when you make me happy. That's the Christian mindset. And I could go on and on about ambition. I mean, I'm for ambition. Ambition's a great thing. It's, it's what drives us. If you live for ambition, though, you're going to be driven. You're going to be, uh, come a, as I said earlier, a narcissist. You don't want to have a life full of ambition just for the sake of yourself. Any ambition we have is to bring God glory, church. This is talking about an eternal, eternal mindset. Uh, here, here's a follow-up reality check, if I could uh, just throw it at you. Uh, uh, why are we so wrapped up in this world, and why do we worry about so much in this world if none of it really is eternal? Let me give you a perspective. I'm going to be in, in, in what county is this? Hamden County, right? Huh? Oh, Berkeley County, yeah. Where did I get Hamden County? That's in Massachusetts. Uh, we're in Berkeley County. That's right. That's the strangest spelling of Berkeley I've ever seen. <laughs> Berkeley. Uh, but we live in Berkeley County. I'm going to be here tomorrow. I don't really care about uh, the weather in Ohio tomorrow. I don't care. Now, if I was flying to Ohio tomorrow, I might be concerned. Is anybody following me on that? I really don't care about the weather in, in Oklahoma tomorrow because I'm not flying there. Now, if I were flying there, Becky, I'd be checking the weather. I'd be concerned. You understand me. I, uh, uh, I don't have anything really to worry about weather because it's not going to affect anything I'm doing. See, we don't worry about things that don't matter to us. Are you hearing me now? What matters to you? Let me ask you now. What matters to you? What? And I'll tell you what matters to you, you're worrying about. You're, you're concerned about. I'm using that word concerned because some of you are like, I'm not worried. <laughs> we don't worry about flight delays if we're not traveling, right? right? Jesus is telling us, what are you worrying about food for? What are you worrying about tomorrow? You can't do anything about tomorrow. And really you can't do anything about anything because I'm God. If you were to make a list of the things that you worry about, hello, and then look at the list, are those things on that list in any way a priority to God? Are they anything that God says, I got? Are you worried about those? You see in this chapter, Jesus' explanation of eternity-based living, it sums up our perspective and priorities they should be, verses 24 and 33. If we don't have two masters, verse 24, and verse 33 is we don't have two kingdoms we're living for. We're living for the eternal kingdom. That's really the summary of this passage. So what we eat, what we drink, what we wear, remember when we talk about those things, those three things, what we eat, what we drink, what we wear, were absolutes in those days. In other words, what you wear, you wore that. They didn't have a bunch of clothes, because listen, in Jesus' day, they, there were no such thing as closets. We were just talking about this, Joe, over in England, uh, uh, where Joe's living. It, it's different there. Most houses don't even have closets. They're, they're very basic. Believe that or not, they're ancient, but they have nothing like we have here. America alone is such a country, it, really in the world, where we have so much that we have storage buildings and... and uh, and all kinds of things. Life is more than what we eat, drink, or wear. The Bible says in verse 25, look at that please, back in Matthew 6. He says, therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what shall ye eat, or what ye shall drink, or, nor yet for your body, what ye shall put on. Is not life more than meat, and the body more than raiment? It's so much more. Paul told Timothy in 1 Timothy 4, 8, now listen to this verse. He said, for bodily exercise profiteth little, but godliness is profitable unto all things, having promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come. It's interesting, he says, it's profitable unto all things. 
That word profitable is an interesting word in Greek. And I'm not trying to be a Greek scholar here, but I am telling you when you look at the definition of that word profitable, it has to do with training. Training. I mentioned earlier about weightlifting. If you want profit in weightlifting, you have to train. You have to work at it. Am I telling the truth? You don't just wake up with a body like I have. You know, these guns, you know what I'm doing? Relax, I'm being funny. You, 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 uh, you exercise. And, and so really, 1 Timothy 4.8 is all about training. He tells Timothy, don't train, verse, uh, verse uh, 7 of that text, I don't have time to take you over there, but he says, don't exercise yourself with, with old wives' fables. In other words, don't train with those myths around you, but rather exercise yourself with godliness. Exercise, train yourself around godliness. This is what I'm trying to tell you, and I, I'm, and I didn't even get to my third point, but I'm trying to tell you this. We have to learn to exercise ourselves with a priority of life, with perspective that goes to eternity. My third thought I was going to give you, and I won't be able to hit it, is what you treasure determines your peace and satisfaction. Oh, this is such a helpful thing. Um, I, I mentioned to you, and here's your homework. Go through the passage of Matthew 6 and just underscore all the places the word thought is used. What are you thinking about? And what you're thinking about, does it give you peace and satisfaction? The repeated command, take no thought. Take no thought. Here's what he's saying, really. Don't worry about it. That's really what he's saying. That take no thought. It's interesting. There's a German word about worry, a German word for worry. And uh, when you take that German word for worry, I'm not even going to try to pronounce it. It's uh, um, it, it, the word uh, I'm looking for here in my note. But uh, it, is, it, it means to strangle. It means to strangle. When you worry strangles you. By the way, I'm going to give you one good thing about worrying. Worrying helps you learn how to meditate. Because really, worrying is just meditating on that awful thing. If you learn to take your energy you're putting into worry and rechannel it to trusting, you'll be a pretty good Christian. All that energy, oh, what's going to happen? Oh, oh, oh. And I have plenty to worry about. Look at me. I got plenty, if I wanted to, to worry about. But if I take that energy, Brother Caleb, that stuff that just keeps me up and, and, and I'm getting nothing from this time expended, if I learn to take that and put it into meditating on the goodness of God. I talk to myself a lot. Admit it, do you? I do all the time. When I'm running, I ran this morning as I'm running. I'm, like, I'm just running and I'm telling myself stuff I need to think about. You know why? Because this crazy mind of mine is so messed up. I get off worrying about stuff. and You know about 90% of what you worry about never even happens. You worry, you worry. What, what was the point of all that? <laughs> you say, well, you know, uh, being careful. Go ahead and kid yourself. There's a difference between carefulness and worry. And I do think we should be careful. I'll talk about that next time. But I'm asking you tonight, this week, let's keep thinking about this. We, we saw tonight the clouds. How many saw those beautiful clouds? Just over my house was a big spot. Lisa, I pointed it out. Giant hole in the clouds. Big old hole. And I said, it could be tonight. All of a sudden, that trumpet blows. By the way, you know whose trumpet it is? God's trumpet. I texted everybody in the church about God singing. You ought to check it out. I believe God blows trumpets. It says the trumpet of the Lord. Amen. He blows his trumpet and the church is taken out of this world. Then what was the point of all this worry? Thank God. Let's stand together, please. Our heads are bowed and eyes are closed. I, my time is up, but I do want to give an invitation as we always do. And folks, I want to remind you we don't do this just because we're Baptists. We give invitations because it might be you need to make a decision tonight. You might need to fix something with God. I don't know where you are in this thing about your life. If you're living in this nasty now and now, if you are, man, you are not at peace. You're not at peace. I think about the last election, 2020, how worked up we all got. Oh, this country's going to fall apart, and it might. 
It still might. But here we are, 2023, and we're still fighting over who's going to be president. All that energy, all that focus, and it is what it is. I'm just telling you this. We need to learn to live with our heads in the clouds, heads in heaven. Father, bless now, I pray, as we extend an invitation. In Jesus' name, amen.